Today we'll be playing another round of Why Is This Fish So Expensive? This time featuring the Osteogaster formerly known as Corydorus schultzi, an undescribed species known in the aquarium trade by the misnomer of Black Venezuelan. I got this group here more than two years ago, and they bred for me for the first time shortly after. In this video I'm going to focus on a more recent spawn just a few weeks ago, to reflect my more current practices to whatever degree they've changed in the last two years. So let's begin with sexing. Like many other quarries, I find it easiest to tell the difference between male and female by size. For example, here is a male, and here is a female. This is usually easiest to see when viewing the fish from above, but for osteogaster I find the females are so much larger than the males that in sexually mature adults you should be able to tell the difference from any angle. In this original group of eight fish, I had three females and five males, which is a great ratio for Corydoras. I don't find the absolute ratio of males and females in a group to be important to at least have a spawn, but they do benefit from having multiple males, so this is great. Right now you're watching them chow down on fragments of a Hikari sinking carnivore pellet, which I've really grown to appreciate as far as dry foods go. In my most recent spawns though, I really leaned heavily on blackworms. Just a quick digression, the reclassification of Corydoras has really grown on me. It's been an adjustment for sure, but I'm finding it really useful to talk about traits that are shared by similar species with a bit more precision than to say, Cory is similar to Aeneas, for example. And I'm looking now for aspects that can be generalized between species in the new groups. So I'll give you one casual observation right now. Osteogaster, as a group, seem to respond to or even require periods of heavy feeding before spawning, more than Hoplosoma, for example. And by heavy, this is what I mean consistently heavy. They spawned last in a tank that is effectively 10 gallons in footprint, with mild water movement and a temperature of about 77 degrees Fahrenheit. My water has been soft lately with almost no mineral hardness, a TDS of about 50, and a pH of 7.9 out of the tap that drops quickly to neutral. Historically I've seen them spawn all throughout the year, including times where the water has been much harder for me, so I don't think they're picky about parameters unless we're talking about water that is exceptionally hard. They used to spawn frequently, sometimes after a water change and sometimes during off weeks. I certainly wouldn't describe them as challenging. Until one day, one of my females, and I think the one that did most of the spawning, dropped dead. No signs, no warnings, and to this day I have no idea why. She just clapped her hands and said, I'm out. And in the year or so since then, they never spawned again. That's why I put all this effort in with the black worms and lots of water changes with temperature drops to try to jolt them back into a rhythm. It's also winter time for me right now, so I have barometric pressure drops happening every now and again to help them feel like the wet season is here. For anyone interested in spawning this species, I would say don't worry too much. The normal quarry tricks do seem to apply here, if you need them at all. So here they are, worked up into a frenzy of activity and beginning to spawn. I've got a spawning mop in the back corner here to see if they're interested, and also some giant hair grass, but that's for a group of autosynclus I keep in here to keep things clean with the heavy food volumes. They like to perch on it. One of the remaining two females stepped up and did most or all the spawning as far as I could tell, and mechanically that went just as I've seen in other species. The males intensely pursue whichever female or females are actively producing eggs. She chooses one and cue the tea pose. After a brief pause, the female takes off to find a place to deposit the eggs. They showed no interest in the spawning mop, except as a barrier to hide their eggs behind. Instead, she opted to place them primarily in or near the corners of the tank glass. They did, however, place a sizable minority of eggs on the stiff shoots of the hairgrass plant. I thought this was really interesting, and I interpreted that to mean that they avoided the mop not because they have no interest in plants, but because they want a more solid structure to place their eggs on. Good to know. Another trait I'm finding to be common for osteogaster is having a large number of eggs released at one time and fertilized by a single T-pose event. I'll skip ahead and say that typically I see a proportionately lower fertilization rate. Just watch this. This is 18 eggs deposited at one time, compared to two, maybe three for smaller hoposoma. There's no way that these can all be fertilized effectively as they sit clumped in a ball between the female's ventral fins. I just can't see it. So here's where the frustration began. They went on spawning for several hours, and as I came in and out of the room, I found patches of residue on the glass where eggs used to be eggs I had just seen deposited a few minutes earlier. I watched them for a while, and I found the culprit. It was the other female, the one not spawning. 
And that makes sense, doesn't it? She knows none of the eggs are hers, so why not? As the group of spawners left any cluster, she would follow behind and eat as many as she could pull off the glass. And I tried knocking on the glass to scare her away. That worked, but only temporarily. Such was her determination for Oviside. If you can see the tank rocking back and forth here, this is me rather forcefully pounding on the glass, hard enough that I actually bruised a couple of knuckles. And as you can see, she was undeterred. It takes a certain lack of emotional maturity to be legitimately mad at a two-inch fish, but I'll admit, fish tacos were sounding pretty good at this moment. Notably, the clusters placed behind the spawning mop being least visible from the rest of the tank were the least consumed. There's a lesson there. After this first spawn, I tried a bit of an experiment. I removed the spawning female and a couple of males to keep her company, leaving only the egg eater. I wanted to see how quickly, if ever, she would take over as the dominant spawner, and whether or not she would eat her own eggs. About a week later, she did spawn, producing an enormous quantity of eggs, probably somewhere between two or three hundred. I never saw her eating them, and never found that I can recall any patches of residue where they would have been if she had eaten some. Again, good to know. Once they finished, I carefully removed the eggs from the glass, and placed them in a specimen container with some circulation to incubate. With such large, dense clusters of eggs, I felt like an antifungal would be appropriate here to keep them from being covered and destroyed. This time I used some alder cones to release tannins in the water, which I've found to be very helpful in holding off fungal growth. The water here was kept at about 75 degrees. And here they are just after hatching. I know I skipped a film segment here, but they got the jump on me. They hatched in only three days rather than four, which I've previously found to be the shortest incubation time for all but Aspidorus. As you can see, only a small percentage of the eggs were fertile. As I mentioned before, the rate does seem to be lower in general for Osteogaster, but this was particularly low. Perhaps attributable to the eggs being stale, this being the first time in over a year, if ever, that this female has spawned. Still, I got some fry and that works for me. Over the next two days, I watched the fry consume their bulbous egg sacs, and as their bodies narrow, their mouths widen. And that, to me, is the sign that they're ready to eat something. I've been weighing the benefits of starting with foods smaller than brine shrimp, and in this instance, I chose not to. Straight to brine shrimp. And that worked out fine. And here they are just a few days later. Getting brine shrimp multiple times a day, they grow quickly. And from this point, their care was fairly routine. The one thing I did differently than what you might have seen before is that I set up my brine shrimp auto feeder, and this time with a post to route the shrimp straight to the bottom of the fry tray. With this, they were eating in small amounts about 12 times throughout the day and night, and the growth rate has been phenomenal. This is a 10 day jump. Pretty big, right? I'm loving the auto feeder. I just recently released them into a larger tank where they can stretch their fins and keep on growing. And here's the part of the cooking show where I pull a conveniently baked pie from under the counter so that we can skip to the good part. This is a batch from more than a year ago, and in this footage, they're just a couple of months older than the fry you just saw. As you can see, they grow quickly and show their sought-after coloration from very early on. It isn't long after releasing fry from those trays that I shift to feeding dry foods primarily. So before I wrap up, let me quickly go back to the opening question. Why are these fish expensive? They're easy to breed, so I wouldn't blame any difficulty, but as you saw, the fertilization rate can be low sometimes, and likely owing to the line breeding of the fish to accentuate this black color, they're the first quarry I've ever bred where I've seen overt deformity in otherwise healthy eggs and fry. Or at least that's been my experience. Could be different for you. They're overbred, and personally I'm not terribly interested in making it worse. I saw what I wanted to see, and I'm ready to move on. So on to the next one. See you next time.